And we're live. We're live on Let's Think Podcast. I'm your host, Sheikh Seven Islam L. I rise giving all thanks and perfect praise to the great God Allah. Highest honors to his holy prophet, Noble Juwali, and honors to all, I mean all participating in that comprehensive program of uplifting fallen humanity. I would like to extend my honors to our esteemed guest, who is back once again, Sheikh Bilal. And I would like to extend honors to the listening audience. How's the brother today? Before we get into this illustrious dialogue, how's our brother Sheikh Bilal today? Uh-huh. Feeling good as Allah always should. Alhamdulillah. 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 Well, today on Let's Think Podcast, if anyone paid attention to the thumbnail, I think they have a gist of where this conversation and this dialogue may go as it pertains to the title, Revealing the Science of the Kaaba. Now, I, as I posted on, on social media, Brother Shay, uh, that this topic here most likely would challenge one's narrative of said subject. But it's all right and well because here we stimulate thought. So as it pertains to the Kaaba, generally, you know, world worldly, worldly no, world known uh to be in Saudi Arabia, Mecca. We know this has been the focal point for quite some time in the Islamic world, Islam. We do know at one point before the the Kibla was the direction of the Kibla was changed. It is said that the Muslims were praying towards Jerusalem. However, that's not even the degree that you're even speaking about. So we're gonna, I'm just gonna open the floor for you and allow you to take the floor and you know, demonstrate for the listening audience. Which Kaaba is the imposter or like uh, the fly said, revealing the secrets of the Kaaba, right? Now the Sheikh just laid in that there, there was a point in time if we have been a part of the, the brotherhood that been in the mosque and we hear this story about how Allah tells Prophet Muhammad in mid prayer, but uh, we're not going to Pray towards Jerusalem anymore. We see you lifting your eyes up to heaven, but then we're heaven is north, which we'll see a little bit later on. And we've directed a new Kibla to you, like another Kibla. What about what about what about the other one? I just gonna not talk about that one anymore. But you know, we do like the brother said, we kind of get told that it was Jerusalem because of the connection between these uh, different parts of this Abrahamic triangle, which seem to be so separate nowadays. But if we if we look at pieces of all of those those histories, kind of without any religious bias, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of unspoken indicators in things like the Quran and the Hadith uh, and references to Mecca and pre-Islamic time frames. But you'll see some of those same things in Syriac, Greek, Latin, and other non-Arabic sources that were from areas around where this. The story was uh, was said that had happened that, and I know it might be a little harsh, because that might prompt some skepticism about whether like, this 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 Mecca and this Kaaba was actually a pre-Islamic pilgrimage site at all, mm-hmm. it, even if it's in the the right location for it to even be what we were, we were kind of taught what it's supposed to be, and and over the past generation, I mean, it's probably been a lot of alternative theories about the Hajj origins. It's, you know, it's been a has been an Abbasid and an Umayyad split for like the longest, like ever since after the time of the Prophet, them two been beefing with each other ever since. But a little bit before that time frame, we see this guy Claudius Ptolemy pop up and he kind of gives it a shot to try to place this city called Mecca somewhere on this map. And the map looks promising, all right? Mm-hmm. Until you realize that nothing looked the same. You got Saudi Arabia drawn wrong. And there's a city called Mecca or Rabbah or Mecca, Rabbah, like the uh, temple of the Lord, you know, blessed city of the Lord. 
and a, a spot on his map that's actually south east of Medina. But brothers, if we look at a map today, we'll see that Mecca is actually south and a little bit west of Medina. So what's this city over here that Ptolemy was putting on this map? Well, we'll, we'll come to find out that his map was totally wrong anyway. So that's why a lot of historians tend to laugh at brothers like that. Because Dan Gibson in this book, uh, Let the Stone Speaks, uh, does a, a couple of uh, different types of calculations in regards to how these maps were plot, plotted and charted and uh, how these directions or these fiddlers were used during the time frame where we'll just go with the story where some were praying towards Jerusalem and, and others were praying somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. There were three different systems of uh, calculation being used at that point in time to plot cities, uh, geographical locations on maps. And Dan Gibson says, while there were early systems developed by Erastocenes in the third century BCE and Hipparchus in the second century BCE, so this is before the Islamic time frame, right? He still yes, says from there on forward, we still only see three different methods. We see the Ptolemy's map based on 81 degrees north and south and 360 degrees east and west. From that, he tried the map 180, but he was already off with 81 degrees north and south being his primary calculation. The second is uh, the, the ARAB system, or we could say pre-ARAB system, because it's not in use anymore, on plotting and charting Gibbler directions or figuring out where you're going in the desert. But this system was based off of 224 degrees around the world. The only one left now is the modern system that everybody else is using that's on point that's right and exact is 360, 360 degrees. So Ptolemy's model kind of completely miscalculated the whole entire world as being 10% smaller than it was. So that's kind of why before the Moors and Muslims tend to show up, some of the maps and even some of the calendars were way, way, way off, <laughs> way off. It seems like the Greeks might have messed it up worse when they came in to Kemet, you know, annexed it for a little bit and kind of ran away with some of their wisdom. When they get back home, they didn't quite put it back together, right? <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, in study, we'll, we'll come to see a place called Petra in, in southern Jordan. And I admit, a couple of years back, I breathed right on over a guy. I didn't know much about it. Nobody mentioned anything about it. I've never heard from well, 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 let me ask you a question, bro. No, I'm going to break your wisdom. No. You know, in 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 the common in the common Islamic um diaspora, and you know, it would be very uncommon for one to even phantom that the Kaaba possibly could be not where they say it is. So I ask you, what led you to even consider the thought? What let consider it? Yeah. Gotta go back into the recesses for that because we've been studying this for a while, but what prompted me to it? The Arab conquest of Egypt, that particular book. Mm. And that Arab one uh, of of Egypt. Okay, yeah, chronological history. So you kind of got to see what was really going on during this conquest. But my Muslim self already knew this Islamic history. But when I'm looking at, you know, chronological history and invasions and wars during this time frame where this religious story says it was a bunch of, you know, prophetic wisdom being, you know, dropped in this area, you can turn around and look at history and be like, nah, bro, something ain't right. So what was really going on during that time frame when they say, you know, we were all being brought together up under this banner, up under a, a system that was already pre-created, but it kind of didn't, it, it kind of seemed like, right, it couldn't even, it couldn't even defend itself, you know, because certain, certain things didn't add up. That book was the one that prompted the thought to just kind of dive in and like some what ifs, because otherwise I probably would have never had that thought, like what if, but then jump down that rabbit hole and then bump into a little bit of info, right? The 
cool thing is it led us to somewhere where some of us was at before anybody else came in and invaded. Just go on right to Petra, right on there, and then trace it back to the ancient days. It said that the first invaders that came into that area uh, with the, I guess, commonly accepted Islamic stories were the Quraysh, the they call them invaders, right? But mm -hmm. If we look up who they conquered in that area, they conquered these groups of people called the Banu Kinana. Banu, Banu Kinana, right? And Can Kinana, I? thank you. Kinana are just the Arabic pronunciation of Canaan. Mm. So some original people, some Canaanites were there beforehand. And it's pretty easy to find in some book references, articles, and online where you will you'll see a few hints at the Quraysh kind of actually being a knockoff of the Banu Kinana. And like big shout out things. and big shout out to uh Sister Dana Marnichi, who is a world known researcher who has been you know exposing that fact that historical fact right there for quite some time so i want to extend my honors and gratitude for her and her work for her um you know being in the forefront of you know giving that 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 information to the people um so before you get into that i got another question before you get into that what would what would that the Arab world benefit from changing or moving the Kaaba? What would they benefit? In today's time or back then? Because I don't think it'll work today. <laughs> back then. Yeah, back then. Uh, it, it probably would have took um, a, a conquest between two ruling factions, uh, Umayyads and Abbasids, that were slowly conquering land from Persia, Zoroastrians, mm -hmm. and getting rid of, but really assimilating a lot of those cultural uh, and, and belief systems until they get to this, this area here, uh, which everybody sees as, you know, Jerusalem, but Jerusalem's it's big compared to Jordan on the other side of it. And it's even smaller than Syria on top of both of them. I think mm -hmm. that's what it would have took. Two different people coming in trying to gain a control of a, of a particular piece of land that people are still fighting over today. Turn your news on and see what's going on over there. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that crazy, man? Yeah, yeah. So again, what would they benefit though what would be the benefit you know if i was to move like if i was if, if we were to if, say we would uh usurp it and move it right what would be the benefit for us moving it i ain't gonna get to it so soon but it's uh safekeeping uh safe, safe keeping. <laughs> Yeah, safekeeping. So if there's a if there's these two factions coming in to to try to take control of all these places, and then one settles in a place, and the other one comes and finds them there. Let's just say hypothetically, a, a particular person throws flaming uh, uh, stones on catapults over into the sacred area, and let's just say there might be a mosque and a, a Kaaba in this sacred area too that got damaged in the battle between these same two people and not at this sacred site is is is, is damaged like what we're going to do all right we're going to try to rebuild it after we you know win this battle but after the battle's won we realize that is it's, it's not quite won because them folks thought we beat got backup coming <laughs> and the rest of the the, the, the older Kaaba just gets the uh, demolished so they let's just say hypothetically they would have taken the black stone or what was left of it and tried to figure out a safe place to transport it for safekeeping. Because I'm pretty sure that land in history got attacked a couple of more times before it got hit with an earthquake. You can probably find that earthquake in the Quran. That's the beautiful thing about it. Go ahead, keep going, brother man. I ain't gonna interrupt you no more. <laughs> no, it's all good, man. If you do got any questions, man, just gonna help add on to the field though. Mm -hmm. but, 
that name Petra really only shows up in Greek language. So we kind of get to see who was kind of, you know, coming in and conquering and trying to take control first because it shows up in Greek first. But if we see it in Arabic, They'll, they'll, they'll at least recognize that the Nabataeans and Petra were speaking a, a form of Aramaic. And if you add or elongate a vowel in Aramaic, you can make Aramaic sound almost exactly like Arabic. So they had a common language. From, but there's at least 65 different mosques that uh, Dan Gibson wound up going to and plotting and charting, which appeared to face way closer to Petra and these particular 65 mosques are what he calls, or air quotes, pre-Islamic mosques, like during the time frame leading up to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But when he goes there with all his tools and then, and, and, you know, GPS equipment and, and compasses and all of that to, to figure out, and, he's, and he plots these lines and then stretches them out and figures out that within two degrees of error, these old mosques ain't pointing nowhere near Mecca. They're actually pointing closer to Petra in southern Jordan than they are to Jerusalem at all. They're about 12 degrees off from Jerusalem, but they're two degrees, within two degrees error, give or take, with lining up with Petra. Mm. We get a hint with this guy Josephus, right? If that's even his real name. You know, that's, that's, that's another podcast. But <laughs> in, in his antiquities of the Jews, he quotes and says on his travels, when he came to a place which the Arabians esteemed their metropolis, which is essentially a mother of the cities, if we bring it from Greek to English, uh, mm -hmm. which was formerly called Acre, but now has the name Petra. So he recognized the a, a older name and Josephus recognized the current Greek name when he came to this place. He says, uh, at this place, which was encompassed with high mountains, that's going to be a key when we, we put this place right beside Mecca today, right? The high mountains. Josephus says, even Aaron went up one of them in the sight of the whole army. So, like, linguistically, one can argue that, like, Rocker might be Josephus' Greek adaptation of another ancient name of this place, Petra, called Rakim or Ra Kaf mean in Arabic R Q M Rakam, which is in the Nabataean Aramaic script, Nabataean uh, name. Now Rakam, funny enough, remember at the beginning where we were like, well man, Petra isn't even in the Quran. There's there's no hint that this this site could have ever been anywhere else, but it actually is. Because if Josephus points at this 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 name of this place, Petra being Rakam. We go to the Quran, chapter 18, verse 9. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Am hasibta anna ashfab al-khati wa raqim kanu min ayatin ar-ajaba. Which, does thou reckon that the companions of the cave, mountain passes, right? The companions of the cave and al-Rakim, the name of that settlement, before Josephus went there and they wound up changing it to Petra. And Arakam are a marvel among our signs. So Allah is all is kind of he's talking about Petra right there, Quran chapter 18, verse 19. It's got to pair up that with a quote from Josephus in the Antiquities of the Jews, where he pronounces the name Rakam with a, a Greek accent. And you can kind of see how it it, it, it adds or loses a vowel with the pronunciation, but the root uh, is exactly the same. Then he's talking about a place that was now called Petra. And you can still trace that word Rakam forward to Petra also. So he ain't mm -hmm. talking about Mecca at all, but neither is Allah in Quran chapter 18, verse, verse 9. Sorry. Right. Well, I needed a bomb for that one. Boom. I needed a bomb, yeah, boom. When yeah, we 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 need I need to get my body, I need to get my sound That's effects. Okay. I definitely need to get my sound effects. Mm, but see, this is the benefit brother man and and that's why i'm studying and trying to get my grasp on you know fluently reading arabic the ability to read the book for yourself mm -hmm. you see what i'm saying and not having to be told what the book says so that that's a power that's a powerful um observation that you that you uh observed in the quran brother man 
honor and gratitude for that work. Yeah, praise due to Allah. I praise due to Allah for a love of linguistics in my heart, man. Because still, that city name by Josephus, that Rockham, is not even is not even really him trying to pronounce it in Greek at all. Rockham is still Nabataean Aramaic, which was translated into the the Arabic language. So there's two hints between Josephus and uh, Eusebius. They both identified this place called Jebel Harun or the mountain of Aaron in Petra in, in Southern Jordan as the biblical Mount Hor. During that last video, we was on God with, uh, with, um, with, with Brother uh, Khalil Ali Allah. He was talking about the Shamsu Hor. He was speaking on the Shamsu Hor, the people of Horus. But here we are in Petra, Southern Jordan. There's this biblical Mount Hor, right? <laughs> the people of that mountain, the Shamsu Hor, <laughs> would, would wind up being the exact same spot where Aaron died at, according to Numbers. 20, verse 27 through 29. And, and Khalil and Khalil mentions it in the um in the quantum physics video, I think is, is it uh, is one I think it is. Yes, it is. It is on, on, on the presentation he did on quantum physics. He spoke about that in another aspect. But yes, sir. Oh my god, you might have to go back and watch that one. Explain yes. the notes then. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, it's because it's not not me talking, but just people that were writing around that time frame when this city was uh, growing and then in existence, and then starts to kind of get plagued with invasions and wars. Plenty of the elder, uh, writing around 70 CE, mentions this city uh, Petra as the capital of the Nabate or the Nabateans, and the center of the caravan trade route. I thought the standard orthodox teachings that method was the center of the trade route, right? Mm. All the way back in 70 CE, Pliny the Elder is documenting that Petra in southern Jordan, the capital of the Nabataeans, who are descendants of the Nana, the Canaanites, that was the center of the trade route right there. Mm. Now, side by side, because I ain't just going to knock it down, but. <laughs> Islam, Islam tells us about a few pagan deities that were supposed to have been worshipped at the Kaaba, right? That, right. you know, in, in the stories, they were, you know, taken out and were knocked down and destroyed. But, but chronological and archaeological history will prove us that, matter of fact, go to, go to Mecca and just walk around. I mean, even if it might look odd for you not participating in everything, but look at how much uh, construction is going on. And there's not one ancient site there's not one preserved ancient village there's not one unesco site there's not not nothing sky rises hotels big old complex uh, but, but none of these ancient sites where these uh previous people were said to have lived at mm. so that was one thought that that uh that arab invasion of egypt book kind of prompted to think like wait a minute <laughs> that's not even what was going on at that point in time like for real, for real, like close this book. <laughs> but we get Vushara, it was an idol that was worshiped in uh, Petra in Southern Jordan. Vushara is the one of the Shara Mountains. And those Shara Mountains are in, in, in Northern Jordan. Same mountain pass and Petra stretches all the way up to Northern Jordan. But Vushara got attributes. Okay? Kind of like Allah got attributes. Well, Shara has as powers and attributes related to uh, agriculture and like animal husbandry. Apparently, they were uh, cattle herders, sheep herders, or whatnot. And irrigation, because remember now we in the desert, right? Mm -hmm. Spot right in the middle of the trade route, leaving one desert and then going directly into the, into another one where you gotta find a swig of water somewhere, right? So of course, this guy here will have uh, attributes akin to it that are related to irrigation. And he was also seen as a divine warrior. Right? Mm -hmm. Shara. We also had uh, another name. I think we might see Hubal in the Quran. Right? Hubal is the giver of understanding or the, the Lord of games. Because sometimes if you look up Hubal, you'll see this 
the statue and in, in one of his hand he's holding uh, seven divination arrows and there's something mm -hmm. different written, written on each of those divination arrows which was a, a practice that may have been going on back then in that time but dang i didn't make it to islam but they are now we already know about a lot uh Manat and that was a you know the the, the triple goddess, depending on what Quran you find, that verse might still be in there, or some sometimes they just take those names out and say those other gods that you were worshiping, you know, those are nothing but fabrications made up by, by your fathers. We know that there's nothing but Allah, none but Allah. But all of those deities were worshiped in Petra in southern Jordan, man. They weren't worshiping that spot called Mecca right now today, because if there were, there'll be remnants of some of those ancient temples and cities and and, and and settlements that were in the area in the story that we've been told all the time, right? Mm. That was there. Nothing mm -hmm. at all. We might find some remnants in like the far, far south in like Sheba or what we call Yemen today. Yeah, it'll so, be definitely Yemen. Same, same people though, you know, mm -hmm. going from that side to that side because we just protecting the trade route that you can enter in through this crack in the mountain to from Arabia into Egypt, or also one of the closest points from Yemen to then cross right on over into was that Djibouti, and then get right on into West Africa or East Africa. Yeah. If you look up the Book of Idols, Kitab al Asnam, the Book of Idols by this 8th century Muslim historian Hisham ibn al Aldi. He quotes and says that the Quraysh also had several idols in and around the Kaaba. And then he mentions two of these that we kind of just went on through and hinted at that the greatest of these was Ushara, also known as Hubal. I was told it was a red agate in the form of a man with the right hand broken off, but then it came into the possession of the Quraysh, and therefore they made for it a hand of gold. But we got to put some more things together though, because now we got Hisham Ibn al Kabi mentioning these idols around the Kaaba in Petra. We, we also see it mentioned in the 10th century Roman Byzantine, if we, we look up the Suda lexicon. And the Suda lexicon, there's a mention of this god named Vusaris, Vusaris, or Vushara, the exact same god, just pronounced in a different tongue. And they're being talked about in a, a, a Byzantine book a whole two centuries later, the same people or the descendants of at that point in time. But all of this is occurring in Petra though, right? Because all of these ancient texts and uh, notes and rock carvings are talking about these people in Petra or in Southern Jordan or the people of the, the people of the sacred city, the people of the red rock because they, they carve their, their, their edifices into the, the living rock, right? Mm -hmm. Namely, this Deus Aris and Petra from the Suda, uh, Suda lexicon, the god Aris, Deus Aris is revered among them. For this one, they especially honor. The statue is a black stone. Mm -hmm. Deus Aris, or Deus Shara, or Hubal, the statue is a black stone, square in shape, unchiseled, four feet tall, two feet wide. It is mounted on a plinth of beaten gold, and to this black stone, they offer sacrifice and pour forth the blood of the sacrificial animals, and this is their libation. Their whole house is rich in gold and contains many votive offerings. Well, even in the 10th century, the Romans were talking about those people there and how they were worshiping some of the gods, some of the rites and rituals, but none of that was going on in Mecca, though. It was still in Petra in southern Jordan. Mm. Now, to, to bring it to, a, a, I guess, a reference that we know, there's a couple of Quran verses that, that do mention uh, Becca, right? uh, Becca being an ancient name for Mecca, right? But with a little bit of comparison with like Bible verses, those Quran verses and Hadith, we can paint a bigger picture. The one who understands the Arabic language, you can kind of see how easy it is to turn a ba or a b into a meme or an m with just one 
herbs food, just like that. You can officially turn a B in Arabic into an M. So this word Becca, B, K, A, right, by, have, uh, at the end, you can turn that by at the beginning into a mean by adding the drop and a curve over it. But when you curve onto the bottom of that bar, now turning it into a mean, you bring that bottom line up, but you and you cover up the dot. Right. That used to be up under the B, because it's not a B no more. Mm. It's an M. So with just one quick swoop. Uh, you just turn Becca into Mecca, and nobody ever knows it was Becca before unless they you know, shine light through the page or they can see it was an edit. <laughs> you know, <right? laughs> there's some philologists out there. Like, I wish I was, um, uh, I wish I was, I don't want to say fluent, but enough to where I could just, you know, rattle it off and be able to deconstruct it and put it back together like some of the people who can speak it. Because I'm, I'm pretty sure that they're able to see things even, even deeper than that. Yes, but being a black man in America with a little bit of uh, Arabic knowledge that I think I, I have, whoever this I am that thinks it has anything, right? Mm -hmm. it, it helps out, right? There was a process on that journey to where I had to, to, to do study and had to fully engulf in this system. And there were certain things in the system that couldn't be understood because it was in a whole different language. Shay. So right. I had to figure out a way to get a bit deeper into it. All of it was to try to learn that language as best I could. So working with the Imam at the mosque or the beloved Sheikh Sufi, it is just Sheikh Sufi Ba. Uh, okay. The Arabic classes are still on his YouTube channel, by the way. So if you search him and scroll back, you can still bump into some of them. But to be able to train this black mind to still be able to read English going from left to right, but also to be able to recognize Arabic in squiggly letters and dots and accents now going from right to left. But that's magic. That's 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 a superpower. You, you can code switch and, and, and use a whole other part of your brain with, with, with new connections that, that happened because we wouldn't have had these connections if I didn't use it and exercise it to be able to understand a, a a whole different language at a degree that I'm able to do it and only get better, you know, with practice and study. But just that little piece, I can look back now 10, 12 years ago and be like, man, when I was behind that mom in the mosque and they were just cycling the Quran, I had no idea what they were saying, you know, just be in the moment. But now if I'm in that moment and I'm listening from my heart space, I can catch words here and now, you know, like, that's the Bakara verse 284, 285. I know those. I know those. And just to be able to do that now, like I'm, I'm thankful because I wasn't able to do that 10 years ago sitting in the hospital today. Did it just say Sufi Bak? Somebody lost it out of the They helped out, man. Come and handy. Yes, sir. Now, Let's just, let's just go on to the Kaaba and Mecca, right? If we look at this, the, the Kaaba and Mecca, so now we've seen a few older uh, hints and references at these rites and rituals at a place that's described exactly the same as the Kaaba and Mecca. Now we're just going to go on to Mecca so we can make this connection, put these two two together to make four, to go square. Mm. <laughs> you, you're, you know the, uh, the curved wall that's on the northwest side of the Kaaba, right? That low curved wall that is not quite attached to it. It's a little bit off the bit. The small curved wall that people walk around is called the uh, Ahatim wall, H-A-T-I-M. Uh, and uh, the unique thing about that Ahatim wall is that if you turn around and use the exact same science that we use to figure out for where we are, to where the Kaaba is, but do it as if we're right in the middle at the apex of that curve to see where that curve is pointing. It's pointing to Petra in Southern Jordan within a two degree plus or minus degree of error. Mm. That's pretty close, bro. The, the Kaaba itself that we use as a Qibla has a Qibla, if that, if that makes sense. Like it itself is, is 
directed back up almost perfectly on point to where there used to be a Kaaba in this place called Petra in, in Southern Jordan. Uh, there's more than one other one, but you know, that, that it takes a little bit more to, to get there. But like how to find it though, because if we go to the mosque and you take these books off the bookshelf and then just sit there all day and night, like, read and read and read and read and read at your local mosque, like a bump into any of that history because they don't. You know, mm -hmm. like, yeah, I no, no, none of the emails going to give you that, brother. I thought one thing, uh, Shape, like we believe in Allah, we believe in the angels, we believe in the prophets and messengers and the revealed books and the divine decree and the day of judgment. But let's just go back to the middle. We believe in the prophets and messengers and the revealed books, right? Mm -hmm. Bible, Torah, you know, yeah. Abrahamic books if we just want to keep it in, in that, that that triangle. Right, right, right. I I'm lost count of how many mosques I don't went into, Shake, and I ain't seen not one Bible, seen not one Torah mm. at, at all. The only other thing any uh, Christian wise you might be able to find in there, and it's not even really Christian, you can find the Gospel of Barnabas in there. But that's about it. But even on the Christian side, the Gospel of Barnabas is apocryphal. They don't even have it in their in their library. But, mm. but the, the the trick to be able to do it is to use those other resources. Like there, there may have been a, a Christian pope that wrote a letter to a Muslim caliph, and this Christian pope might have poked fun at the fact that he knew a secret that that Muslim caliph knew that he didn't think he knew. But if we didn't, if we don't, you know, use resources outside of like our standard Orthodox Islamic uh, text that you can find at, you know, you know your any neighborhood at mosque, we won't, ever, we won't ever find it. But if we do use those Islamic uh, texts and literature, we use them and we keep them on cap, we keep them on down. But then we turn around and use all the other references. We don't use them as from, from the perspective of a, of a a, a devout Muslim, you know, trying to, you know, figure some things out. You do it from the perspective of, of somebody who's diligently researching chronological history that's placed right beside whatever religious spiritual history esoteric that you might know. So that you can put all of that on the scale. You can make it all balance out for you and figure out what to use to better self and move on forward. You know? mm -hmm. But We'll, just, we'll start with Hadith, because there's a few. And I mean, a, a, a small few. In volume two, right? Hadith, is, volume two, book number 26. What is Sahih as Muslim? This is... Bukhari. Bukhari, okay. Volume two, book 26. Hadith number 598, narrated uh, Ibn Abbas, it's a hint, right? Abbas, Ibn Abbas from Abbas, uh, Abbasid dynasty. There you go again, Umiyads and Abbasid. It makes perfect sense, though. So we get a little bit of history and that's, that's still left in the Hadith. They say um, Ibn Abbas states that the, the people of Yemen, super, super South Arabia, so the people of Yemen used to come for Hajj and not bring enough provisions with them. And they used to say, oh, we depend on Allah. But mm. on their arrival to Medina, they used to ask and beg the people for provisions. And so Allah revealed a verse that says, and take a provision with you for the journey. But the best provision is fear or consciousness of Allah. Yemen's in South Arabia. The Hadith said they got to Medina got more water and provisions, and they continued their journey on the high. Mm. But if I'm coming from Mecca, going north, I'm going to bump into, I'm coming up, I'm coming from Yemen going north, I'm gonna bump into Mecca before I get to Medina. Abu Hadith says they left Mecca and just skipped right over, I mean, they left Yemen and just skipped right over Mecca stopped and got some water and fed the camels in Medina and continued their journey. 
Wow. Well, that's where they missed something. They, or they or did they turn around and just go back to Mecca, but that doesn't make sense. And book number eight, Hadith number 2477. Don't make no sense, but that'll be that. <laughs> <laughs> that's Hadith, man. God almighty, brother. It makes no sense. What number is that again? Uh, book number eight, uh, Hadith number 2477. Wow. So it's the, some of those Hadiths are, are huge volumes, like Bukhari, depending on which, which, which I guess, which uh, print you get, is like seven or eight books. And then depending on any other, um, I guess, transmitters of the Hadith, the volumes get you know, bigger or smaller, but there's never just one book when it comes to the deep is multiple. Mm. But in, in that particular one, Ibn Hawala states that is someone that in the story is saying that it's close to the Prophet Muhammad, right? Mm -hmm. He says that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, it'll turn out that you will be armed troops, one in Syria or Asham, one in Yemen, and the other in Iraq. So Ibn Hawala said, well, choose, choose for me a full apostle of Allah if I reach that time. Like, tell me, tell me where you want me to go so I can fight this jihad for this, for this, for this way and bring Islam to these people. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, replied and said, go to Ashams or go to Syria because it is Allah's chosen land to which where his best servants will, will always be gathered. But if you are unwilling to go to Ashams, then go back to your Yemen and draw water from your tanks. For Allah has taken on my account a special charge of Syria and its people. So Ibn Allah is a general, right? And he's being told that all right, by the Prophet Muhammad to go to Syria, go to Syria. And if you don't want to go to Syria, then go back to Yemen. This is a continuation of his journey or his hajj, his pilgrimage. He's leaving Yemen and he's already passed the site where we know as Mecca today. They stopped and gotten water and reserves in Medina and now are told to go to, I <laughs> told to go to Syria. Before they even get to Syria, they get to Petra in southern Jordan, but that's where the water resources start at. So like, Syria is the chosen land, man. I thought I was told in the mosque that Mecca was that the whole entire time. Mm. Um, that's where Allah sent Abraham to, to go drop off Hagar and Ishmael, and that's where everything happened. That, but I mean, why, why in the Hadith they making fun of, of Saba or they making fun of Yemen's water resources? To make that one make sense, but every, it, it didn't take long at all to figure it out because to still to this day, today, it's estimated that 17.8 million people in Yemen lack access to safe and adequate water resources and sanitation services in Yemen. And that only one third of the population was even connected to a pipe water network. So apparently like the scarcity of water that was going on in, in Yemen back then is still going on today. It matches right on up with that Hadith reference of these people leaving Yemen and then stopping to get water in Medina because they ain't have none in Yemen. And then they go to somewhere else that isn't the Mecca that everyone understands today because they're still going north. So you get one more direct reference to it still being Petra in Southern Jordan from a Hajj and Mecca reference in Al Nabiga Al Dubaini's uh, celebrity uh, ode is addressed to this Lachmet king named Nutman ibn Al Mundir. On page 22, that's a long note, man. Mm -hmm. It says, I swear by the life of he whose Kaaba I have circled, and I swear by the thick blood poured upon the sacrifice stones by the Lord, preserver of birds and his sanctum touched by the riders to Mecca between the wells al Veil and al Sad. Stop. There's only one well in Mecca, right? The Zamzam well. Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Dubaini just said, t t mm -hmm. touched by the riders to Mecca after going through this uh, rite and ritual uh, between the whales of Al Tayo and Al Saad. But it's only one whale in Mecca. But as soon as we get to this place called Petra or Becca or the Valley of Becca, there's a whale on this side that they call the whale of Assad, and there's a whale on this side that they call the whale of Al Hale. So even in the letters from someone else that talks about him going to the, the, the Hajj and explaining it to another person, he describes himself even going to go take this rock and ritual in Petra in southern Jordan or in southern Syria, because I, I doubt there was that that dividing line uh, back then to separate those two countries, right? And mm -hmm. they're still connected on the map today. But which, are, which most of those uh, lines, if not most of those lines are, are fairly new anyway. Mm -hmm. And they're still erasing and then adding on. And then now nah, let me draw the line this way so we can leave these people over here. You know, same, same, same devil of science. People in that area, Petra, they were called uh, Nabataeans. And the, and the whole hint about water in that Hadith, right, is because in Aramaic, Nabataean means those that draw out water. Mm. It means those that draw out water. But then as soon as you enter the complex in uh, Petra and Southern Jordan through what's called a seek or a, a, a probably about a, a six meter wide, uh, super long crevice or crack in a mountain pass, it leads you directly into that site. But before you go in, those two whales, Al Hale and El Side, are on either side of you. One's just a little bit further away, but those are the whales where the male and the female would do their wudu. That's where they would do their process of purification before they enter the holy city. With it, it, it lines right on up. We can't leave out the Bible now, right? Because the Bible talks about Becca also. <laughs> we can't leave it out. We won't throw away no baby and no bath water. Mm -hmm. nah, right on. Take out the dirty water and put fresh water in there. Right, right right on. The baby. Yes, sir. Yes. In Psalm 84 is another reference to uh, Becca. But remember how in Arabic we can turn Becca to Mecca with one quick edit. Yeah. Whether it's in Arabic or Aramaic. Since they say Becca is an ancient name of Mecca, to like try to make it uh, be reconciled within the, the, you know, standard Islamic history, right? But one who understands that language, you know, like we were saying, can see how easy it is to just turn one letter into another by covering up the dot on the bottom, based on how you make that curve. But in Psalms 84, verse five and six, it also mentions the Valley of Becca. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. Pause. Even in Hebrew, that word pilgrimage is H G G, Hajj. Mm -hmm. Just like we say in Arabic, Hajj, same exact thing. Mm -hmm. But when the Bible is talking about the same process, uh, a similar place, and it hints at the people. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who set their hearts on pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Becca. They make it a place of springs. Autumn rains also cover it with pool. They make it a place of springs. They drew out water. <laughs> Nabataeans means those who draw out water. Now, we won't leave out the Quran either. We'll bounce back. Chapter three in Surah Al Imran, we still see Becca again. And now we get a hint at what was there. The first house of worship appointed to men was at Becca. Hmm. Mm. Depending on <laughs> depending on what translation you get, they'll leave Becca in Arabic. It'll still say Becca in Arabic, but when you flip over to the English translation to that particular verse, they'll have Mecca in parentheses beside that word. Uh huh. Uh huh. 
to make it seem as though it's in a, well, well, in a sense, well, to make it interchangeable, so to say. Mm -hmm. To interject and place words where they don't belong. That interrupts the whole rhythm. Right. So what's the reconciliation? I don't know. <laughs> that's not that's not how all I say it works. No. Even in chapter eight and verse three of a Sumerian Asapir, which is a Syriac text, and then Syriac and Aramaic are cousin languages, they actually look pretty much identical when you write them out side by side, and both can still be connected to Arabic. But in a Samaritan text that's written in Syriac, it mentions these same people again. Similar process, and it ain't talking about none of these things happening in Mecca either. It reads as follows, all of the children of Ishmael who are the seed of his firstborn. It was Ishmael's firstborn. This is Ishmael's, Ishmael's firstborn, Nebut, the oh. father of the Nabataeans. Nebut, the hey, father Nebut. of the Nabataeans. Ah. That's where they get the name from. And then it says in this Samaritan text from Syriac, they ruled from the river of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates, and they built back up. Just talking about him, just talking about us. I remember now the TM means those who draw out water. So of course they ruled from river to river. Of course they knew how to route water from certain places and then bring it into a city that didn't have water because it was on the middle of a trade route. There's a whole bunch of people coming in it's a it's it's a holy a righteous place so they even have water springs on the outside for people to do voodoo and purification at before they go in but we remember that hadith from earlier about the the, the, the hajj coming from yemen and those sacrifice stones so that place in picture remember had that name Rakhim, or Rakhim, where everything that don't quite line up with mecca lines up perfectly Mm. It lines up perfectly. Mm. There are these things called gin blocks. You know the story mm. of uh, going on the, the high right, and then you get to a certain point throughout the, the process and you have to cast these uh, stones at uh, Shaitan. Uh, they used to be pillars in Saudi Arabia, right? But it's a part of the high to where you cast these stones at Shaitan. Blah, blah, blah. But there's gin blocks on the outside of that sacred precinct uh, marking this city called Petra. And still to today, you can find piles and piles and piles and piles of stones on the bottom of the pillars as if the exact same rite was going on up there at a time before. Anything like that was going on in that place called Mecca down there. If we look at that, that, that rite or that ritual in Mecca today, the, the only reason it looks so odd and the stuff for a lie, I hate to say that, but that process where the pilgrims go stone the shaitan, it used to be three, three very, very large pillars where people would, would throw the rocks at the shaitan in Mecca today. But man, they had to get knocked down so they can replace by like a 26 meter long wall with a, a safety wall around it to prohibit another deadly stampede of people. Ain't you going to imagine that? that all the stuff that was going on in Petra in Southern Jordan when the Banu Kinana, uh Canaanites or the Nabataeans were there, the sons of Ishmael were there, up until we see the Abbasid and Umiyas come in. We don't we don't see we don't we don't see or hear anything like that going on because it's the center of the trade route. Right? It gotta be protected. Won't allow anything to come in that to mess that up because I'm pretty sure with all that gold they had up under the Kaaba that they had to protect their their, their process of receiving that and providing them services for the people and make sure they could be kept that land on lock. But yeah. that was a point in time back in Mecca where, where, where people were so excited and, and, and so invigorated to go do this one particular part of the Hajj to cast these stones at the Shaitan, which are just three big old pillars to where they completely forgot about the sanctity of that whole process, that right and ritual. Forget the fact that it ain't in the right place at all. But so many of the Muslims in Mecca started to run and rush up to these pillars so they could be the first one to throw a rock at it. Stop, real off. 
and completely lost themselves because they were engulfed and wanted to be the first one to go through this rock to where people literally got ran over at the hot. Mm. Yes. And they had to change the holy city again and knock down them three pillars and turn it into a big old 26 meter long wall. So now everybody can walk up to it and throw rocks at it because it symbolizes the uh, stone and the shaitan. Oh, the shaitan regime. That's interesting, man. That's 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 real interesting. You said they got stampeded, bro. All right, stampeded. If we look up, um, then it can just be uh, Google. It'll be like the third or fourth picture that shows up uh, of gin blocks or uh, pillows of shaitan in, uh, in Mecca. And you'll see an older photo of three really, really tall ones. And then a few photos down, you'll see just what looks like a super long wall that just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. And, goes. and it's a whole bunch of people just standing up alongside it, you know, at that particular part of the rock ritual, throwing rocks at it. But before it was that one big wall, yeah, people were like stampeded and, and ran over. Some people got suffocated. I think a few people actually lost their life in that particular event. Mm -hmm. Immediately, like the, the 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 builders and carpenters had to come in and knock all that down and figure out a way to make it more safe, so that you know some of the lives nothing like that's happened since. You know, and hopefully it don't ever happen again. It's, it's a holy and, 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 and spiritual ritual that, that Allah tells us to do. And why, why were they acting like that? Mm. The pillars gonna still be there. Right. There's some show up builders over there that, <laughs> that built that complex, right? Ain't yes, sir. One pebble knocked that pillar down, you know. So be, be Muslims and submit to Allah. Don't, and don't kill another brother Muslim <laughs> trying to run you through a rock at a pillar and stop your Allah. <laughs> Wow. Yes, sir. Yeah. That that mountain pass in, in, in Petra, if we if anyone were to look it up and figure out that it looks impossible because there's a mountain pass and a mountain pass and a huge valley in between both mountain passes. But if one were to zoom in on the map or to look for this term called the SIQ, uh, S I Q. It was going right on in to this uh crack and crevice that just looks perfectly cracked in this mountain that's wide enough to where three or four camel carts can pull themselves up and down and not bump into each other. And the beautiful thing about the city, which makes their name Napateans and how they're described in all of those deep references, Bible verses, Samaritan texts, uh, back and forth between caliphs. As soon as you walk into the sick or this crack that leads you into the city, if you look to your left or right, their irrigation channel carved mm -hmm. into the side of the passageway to enter in. And as soon as the water is laid in, it splits off to fountains or uh, storage tanks. So now they live up to their name because they, they mastered irrigation from places because of course they they were said that they were they ruled between the river of Egypt all the way to the great river of Euphrates and everywhere else where there was water, they knew how to get water from there to where they were at whether they were figuring out how to put pipes up on the ground or taking water from uh, tops of mountain passes and places where water gets stuck and pools form up there. They were very challenging. All right, to bring it on down into this city and, and mastered it and perfected it to a point where like, you can still see it and kind of you know conceptualize it today. All of those things are still there. Even that lines up. But when you run in and you see that they're there are two reservoirs on either side as you go in. Right, so can we imagine, uh, can we imagine Hagar like, like running between uh, Safa and Mara, right, looking for looking for water for somewhere, looking for water because Ishmael's thirsty. You know, Abraham had left him in the dark on desert. They left him in a barren land where apparently there's nothing at. It might have been abandoned at that time. I'm not too sure. But in that story, it says Jabril or Gabriel comes down or he kicks his heel or he digs his wing into the ground and up comes a spring of water. <laughs> up comes a spring of water. She's running back and forth looking for a spot. I know there has to be water here somewhere. And all of these texts that describe these people in these places, they're always described as people who draw out water. 
people who make this place into fountains and springs, people who are also able to store that water, you know, mm -hmm. they don't believe that the angel came down and did that or not, you know, that's, that's, that's between them. But you can go there and look at those, those prayers of course today. Yes, sir. Now, right in the middle of that almost kind of offset center, kind of like the heart is, there's what used to be a Kaaba. Hmm. There used to be a Kaaba there. If one were to research Kasser Al Bent, Q A S R A L B I N T. Uh, Kasser in Arabic is actually where we get the word castle from in English. I don't really like <laughs> the linguistics, but Kasser al Bent was a, it was a temple to one of those gods that we mentioned earlier. You remember uh, Zushara, the god who was represented by a, uh, a four by four by two uh, black stone, partially unchiseled. There's a temple to that guy right there, right there behind what's left of a, a base for the previous copy to have stood on. I had to pray to go there just to be able to say I did it. If, if, if I were to, to measure the, the diameter on each of the sides of that Kaaba, or what was left of that Kaaba and Petra in Southern Jordan, and overlay it with the one that's in Mecca today, it even is, is close within like just hairs of, 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 of degrees. It's, it's almost spot on. The dimensions are almost perfect. There's even enough space for a host of people to walk around the whole entire complex in a circle and it's marked off in that same exact area. In this temple, Kasser al Bent, or the Temple of Gulshara. This God that was uh, venerated at and, and worshiped in the form of this uh, square black stone was stored in Kasser al Bent, this, this huge, also square, square shaped uh, castle that was behind this pre Islamic uh, Kaaba in Petra in southern Jordan. Right, it lined right up. Like the flyer that was up, it's actually the photo that's up in the top left hand corner. The photo that's in the very, very top left hand corner. Let's see if we can find that right quick. Yeah, that's Kasser Al Bent. Let's see if we can find that right quick. Presentation mode. Um, and even if I, uh, if I send you some photos, you got the ability to uh, screen share. Let's see. No, I can't see it. Let me see. Try to still show as much of it as possible, but on the top left-hand corner of the, the flyer for the podcast here, there's what looks like uh, remnants of a, a pretty large cube-shaped building. And a little bit in the foreground, there's a, a square shaped uh, platform with a few bricks here and there up on, on uh, either side, almost in the exact same dimensions of the, the copper that's in uh, Mecca today. There's a, there's a beat about it being destroyed and leveled uh, intentionally because remember that question you asked today, like what was their reasoning or what could they benefit by, you know, moving or relocating? And uh, now, now here we are with right, right there. The, the yeah. bit of it. You know, they had, they had some wars. I mean, at that point in time, and the Kaaba was damaged, and that Kasser al Bent that uh was left of that that temple that one can kind of see on the top left hand corner that was also damaged. The 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 the, the cube or that square uh, uh black stone that uh, was representative of the god uh, Zeus Iris or Zeus Shara. Right. Or I don't even. I don't have it. Point. Ah, no worries, man. I got you. Uh, Share it for us, brother.
three that was sent. It's just. A... Oh, it seems like we have a lost it, brother, but I'm sure he'll come back in. I'm sure he come back in. Anybody in the chat? Make sure everybody in the chat. Make sure you hit the like button. Also, if you have any questions, place them in the chat. I'm gonna try to strive to get us a um a time for Q and A. Any type of questions you want to ask about the brother's presentation? Awareness daily, peace, God. Honey, peace, God. Who? King Ryo, peace. Chase, peace. So we can get the brother back in. There he is. Oh man, we're like, oh no. No, no, I ain't gonna let that one slide. No, uh, I wasn't able to uh, share them. I'm not too sure how to do that here on this uh, this particular platform. Matter of did go ahead and get them uh, at least send over to you. <clears throat> or probably uh, put a put a post together so you can uh, complete the propose that and put that on the on the uh, on the Facebook page for the podcast later on, inshallah. Yes, sir. I think I shared well well, I know I shared the flyer onto the Facebook, so it's basically you say it's on the flyer to the left hand corner at the top, right? Mm -hmm. Top left hand corner it'll be the Casarao bent, and then there's a square shaped platform directly in front of it that was the uh, the ancient Kaaba or the Nabataeans or the mm. people who lived in Petra in southern Jordan during that time frame. Because look, I see everything else lines up. There's a uh, hadith that talk about these two wells that were on the outside of the holy city, but there's only one well on the inside of Mecca. All right, so that don't match. But in Petra, there are two wells on the outside, but you know, not not back in Mecca. They say it's a, a place of uh, hanging dates and grapes and vines and things like that. But if you go to Mecca today, they don't grow any of those things there naturally. You know, they're trying to geoform to be able to grow certain things like that there. But those any of the, anything you can grow down there today is a native to that to that area of that palm tree here and there, maybe. You know. Hmm that dimension of the blood sacrifice stones and that other hadith like nobody doing that like in the in the in the complex and and make it a day that's not a particular part of the hajj where they you know they sacrifice the sheep in in the, in the holy complex but in petra in southern jordan there's uh in books and references you'll find this it's called the the high place of petra it's just such a generic title, but it's only because the, the, the name of this place has been lost. But the high place in Petra, there's what there's what looks like um, a Shiva Lingam, right? From the Hindu tradition, it's a square base with a, a small uh, kind of cuboid shape in the middle, the indentation and a channel cut out on the back side. And tests have been done on it. There's small little traces of you know animal blood on those there. So, but like there's an actual spot in Petra that matches up with these uh, these hadiths that mention people going through certain parts of their rites and rituals on Hajj. But when we think of Hajj today, we think about going to Mecca, but in all of those particular hadiths, even that Bible verse, they were talking about Petra in Southern Jordan. Because all of those things lined up with the cityscape there. And they don't quite line up with, with Mecca today, you know, stop real life. I don't know if ones have looked at uh, videos of, of people like going through the high right, and then going through certain parts of it and actually uh, thought about it, right? And seeing the people running up and down or, you know, briskly jogging up and down this hallway, running between this mountain of Safa and Marwa in Mecca. But if you look at them doing it in the, uh, the videos, right, they're inside of a complex. Mm. How are the two mountain passes inside of the complex in Mecca? It's because of, over there in Mecca, they're not mountain passes. They're, they're just kind of small. 
they almost look artificial shape, you know, but they 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 look like they would be mountains, but they're too small. They're just small enough to where they fit up under the ceiling of the of the complex and and Mecca. But those can't be the two mountains that Hagar was running back and forth between looking for some water. They're mm. not even taller than the ceiling. Mm. Very good. Have a little bit of weight if there were those two uh, two wells right there, but there's only one and make it so like it doesn't quite it doesn't quite line up there. Yeah. Great point, shit. But it but it does in, in, in Petra. It does. The Kaaba there, the sacrifice stones, the the people in Yemen left South Arabia and then they got to Medina to get more food and then they kept going on Hajj just because they weren't going to Mecca, just because they were going to Becca. And right. Becca is a uh, Petra in southern Jordan. Right. So I mean at least now we got that, you know, that's that's a lot to you know connect like uh Mecca and, and, and Saudi Arabia, we, as we know of today, to there, there being a city called Petra in Southern Jordan that used to have a, a Kaaba on the inside of its uh, uh, holy precinct. There was a temple behind it where all the pagan gods that, you know, the Quran talks about these people housing and worshiping. Uh, there's mountain passes where it seems that if we put the story of Hagar running back and forth in between, there actually are two mountain passes on either side. And remember that those mountain passes have tracks in them where the people come in. But also in those mountain passes in the, the Sikh, that they call it, they're the irrigation channels that are carved into that mountain pass. So that's why Hagar is running back and forth between Safa and Marwa. But she knows it has to be some water coming in from somewhere. So mm. I know, I know that's, that, there's no, there's no, uh, there's nothing like that in that long hallway in Mecca to make that Hadith in that story line up. But it's mm -hmm. right there in Petra in Southern Jordan and a place to where if we go back far enough for the people that look like you and me right there. Yes, sir. No matter who lives there right now. Yes, sir. No matter who lives there right now, but there's still one more left though, man. Like, you ever heard of the... Um, I know one, one probably you know heard of uh, uh, the people who uh, worship Mithras or uh, the Zoroastrians, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. From the uh, Minid Empire, I can never say that word right because it's not Arabic. Um, Stop it a lot. But if one were to look up these keywords together, the cube of Zoroaster. What? There's a cube, of the cube of Zoroaster, or if they say it in Farsi or in, in a Persian, they call it the Kaaba e Zarost, the cube of Zoroaster in the Fars province of Iran. That was the, the middle photo that was sent. So if we look at the flyer, the photo that's on the bottom left hand with the uh, what kind of looks like a three-dimensional oblong square kind of coming out of a channel dug in the ground. And I'm not too sure if that photo shows the rock carvings in front of it, right? But this whole area is in notch e rustum in Iran. There's a whole other cube over there in Iran. It's kind of a oblong one, but it's still a, it's still a cuboid, right? But this one's attributed to Zoroaster. It ain't even attributed to anything Islamic. Mm. Some Zoroastrians. So, so we would have walked up to the back side of it and see what it's facing. The cube of Zoroaster in Iran is facing the tombs of Darius the second, Achaemenid king and ruler, or Persian, you can say. It's, it's facing the tomb of Artaxerxes the second, Darius the Great, and Xerxes. First, all four of those are directly in front of the Kaaba e Zorost or the Kaaba of Zoroaster or the cube of Zoroaster. Now, one cool thing to, to realize is that the tombs of all of those kings 
if, if one would have, you know, looked up the tomb of Darius the second or the tomb of Xerxes, we'll see that they're, they're carved into the living rock. Like they had to get, they had to get up high, like dig holes to, to get up and then carve cross shaped uh, indentations into a mountain and then carve a tomb into that so that their, their kings could be interred or buried in them. But that exact same architecture of carving into the living rock was also done in Petra in Southern Jordan. We see I like some of those uh, things that were going on, rites or rituals or practices that connect to a, a pre-Islamic people still in Arabia, it's, it's still, there's still traces of what we would look at as Islam in it. There's still a Kaaba, there's still a writing ritual, they're still doing voodoo, they're still praying around it, they still have a whole, you know, couple of days in this in this process before they leave and go back home. We we'll still do the same thing today, you know, reconcile that. It's still the, the, the similar process, it's just now all those other pagan gods and deities ain't, ain't there <laughs> you know, anymore. They all have to worry about uh, a lot uh, uh, Manat and Aluza and Ushara or Luzaris or anything. All they pick is just the Kaaba. It's just that black stone. And then now that's just that's where it is. Now the key thing is like, if we follow those, those inner traditions though, like the inner traditions, like what we know is Sufism, right? And we can even say like what was going on in Jerusalem and in the Jordan and Syria area, which is say like uh, Hebrewism and Christian mysticism, uh, Kabbalah, or what was going on in Iran way back at that time. And that's where the Magi wound up coming from, the Mithraeus and Zoroastrian. But they practiced something on their tradition that was almost exactly similar to what we have right here in Islam today. You know, the there, there are three sayings around their logo, like the Sufi school got three words around our logo, right? Islam, good Islam, thoughts, Islam. good words, and good deeds. Those are those are the main three precepts of the Zoroastrian religion. Hey man, I can get with that. Mm -hmm. I listen. Yeah, their 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 logo is is what looks like an Iranian guy flying on what I already know is is the the, the sun disc with wings on it. <laughs> We look up the, the, the logo for the Zoroastrians. Even though it's, it's personified as an Indo Aryan, I read an Indo Aryan got curly hair like me and you do, Shay. Yes, sir. So, who were the original people back then before any of these, these so called Indo Aryans showed up <laughs> with the people that are deifying uh, have traits like us? Or even if they present themselves with traits like us? Because if you look at a Persian today or someone in Turkey right now, and they got no hair like this. Mm -hmm. If you look at the so those so-called Babylonian kings, you know, the big ones, you know, holding the lion and whatnot, they got really, really curly hair to pick it down to. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But ain't that a rabbit at the mosque? I used to coach who got no curly hair like that. <laughs> Stop I would it. say I would say not stop for law. That's what five percent of say. That's emphatically now cipher. Like no. emphatically now cipher. Oh, definitely. The yeah, ancient tradition still safe. goes back to the Rig Vedas, and yeah, you can still keep it spiritual. So, just because you know we can find a Cabo or a cube in another tradition or another religion or in another country, in front of some tombs of some Achaemenid kings, and we know what. Xerxes and Cyrus and all them did throughout history, you know, whatever, you know, we can we can still trace it to this place in, in Petra with a Kaaba. We can trace it to this place in Mecca with a Kaaba. But a, a, a beautiful thing I like to just answer is that that's why I think Sheikh Abdul Bamba is so important when it comes to some of the teachers we get from the super order that we are in, because yeah. we noticed that the by far is Ramadan right now for the the Muslim community. Most of the by far Muslims do not observe the Ramadan fast. You know, most of them don't they, they might not even make salat. They're gonna be doing their zikr all day. And if they're not doing that, they're doing work. But they're still saying their zikr out loud though. 
but to mm-hmm. people's on the outside, you know, that might look, oh, I don't know, that might look heretical. I try to explain to me, Brother Bifal, how are you a Muslim and you ain't prayed in not one Ramadan for the last how many years? I ain't gonna ask no Bifal that. That Bifal is a Muslim. <laughs> Bifal is a Muslim. Yeah. Because it's all about the inner traditions, right? And, and Sheikh Abdul Bama still gives us teachings to uh, to people that might be at an Islamic level of understanding, but he also has deeper teachings, like when we get told to to do a zikr or to do a mantra, right? But you do it in in meditation and and focus on your heart space while you're doing it. You can recite it out loud if you want. You can recite the mantra silently all you want, but Mentally, if, if, you, if you're perceiving yourself doing anything on the inside of this meat suit, you're focusing on your heart space while, you, while you're doing your zikr. If that ain't the biggest secret that somebody can drop and give away, like it's always been right here the whole time. This is the Kaaba. This is this is where we're where it's where we're encircling. Like every time you see a, a painting of Jesus, peace be upon him, in like certain high Renaissance paintings, what are you doing? Like he's pointing up with one hand, boom, boom, and he's pointing to the heart with the other, letting you know where this this, this comes from. Right? Keep your thoughts focused on things eternal, right? and keep this thing circumscribed. Keep on going around it to make sure ain't no dirt getting in there. <laughs> Keep on going around this heart to make sure you don't feel fit in there. Keep polishing that heart up. Keep polishing the mirrors of that heart. Keep polishing the windows of that heart so that when you get everything that is not a lot out of it, you get your ego out of it. You get your attachment to carnal passions and desires out of it. You get your attachments to materialism out of it. And you get anything that's just damn right evil out of it. Everything that is not a lot out of it, the only thing else that can fit in there ain't nothing but God. To skill to nest. Right. To skill to nest. That's the whole process. That's that's the real jihad. So regardless of if figuring out that there might have been a previous Kaaba in another place, and then you can still go to Iran and look at the the Cuba Zoroaster still till today. Like that doesn't have to shake anybody as a Muslim. That's just chronological history. Because even when we get into the Quranic teachings, Allah tells us this is where he lives. You a true believer? I don't fit in the heavens and I don't fit in the earth. Allah fits in the heart of a true believer. So you turn your face to the east or you can turn your face to the west. There you will find the face of Allah looking to the east or looking to the west. So no matter which way I turn, Allah's face yeah. is also turned that way. <laughs> and Allah's face is also there. So it's mm-hmm. anything out there. I gotta I gotta get this thing clear. I gotta focus this and this. There gotta be a heart and mind connection. You know, for those that do observe the salat uh, prayer during Ramadan, alhamdulillah. Because every now and then, brothers, you have to you got, you gotta put your heart over your head. Mm. Every now and then you have to put your heart over your head. And to make that make sense when you go down into prostration, you're at such an angle to where your heart is just slightly above your head, way down here when you be in, when you prostrate. And then scientifically, what that does, that sends a um a flow of blood to wash over the brain, mm. oxygenate the brain. So exactly. Yeah. And then as soon as it gets done doing that, and you can you come back up and you sit down and kneel for for just a moment, because Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him in the hadith said, before you move to the next posture. He would always give every single bone in his body a chance to reset. So no matter how he moved, whenever he sat back down, he would make sure that he's perfectly comfortable. He's busy, not stressed out. He ain't sitting on one leg too hard or the other. He gets himself ready. But he's allowing that blood that you just said that got re-oxygenated to do what it's supposed to do while it's up here. Because you're still in the moment right there. <laughs> And if you're thinking about your higher self and this connection to Allah, or if you're thinking about this heart to, to my connection, where is this blood about to go? As soon as it gets deoxygenated, it goes right on down to this spot right here to where Allah is closer to me than my own jugular vein. Because some magic is about to happen. This blood that ain't got no oxygen in it, it's going to go right on back down into these heart and lungs. It's going to breathe some more right back into it. 
and send it right back on through the body to do it again. It takes a mastermind to create some stuff like that. A lot as, of work. As, as the sap returns to the root. <laughs> I mean, that that's a perfect to. cycle. That's a circle, brother. Yes, sir. So keep it circumscribed. That's it. Yes, sir. And you see, and you and, and you know, as, as you got that science around your neck, that's a circle too. Stay yeah, circumscribed. Man. You know, Always. you know that's a that's a beautiful measure right there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's and it's straight Islam. I'm pretty sure if I were more well versed in Zoroastrianism and, and into that esoteric, it'd probably be explained the exact same way through their system, regardless of what they pray to or how they pray. The the Zen de Vesta is a pretty deep book. If anybody even if, if, if people hadn't even thumbed through the Zen de Vesta a Zoroastrian book, oh God, please download it. feel so after being Muslim and studying Sufism for so long, going to read a book like the Zen the Vesta that was essentially, as far as chronological history goes, something that was amalgamated and then led into what we know today as Islam, right? To read a book that has some bits and pieces of ancient Islam in it. And you, you can't help but take what is useful like Bruce Lee said, and then discard what 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 isn't, and take everything that's inherently your own. But we get to our nation, we get the best part. Right? Go back and get the best part and bring it back. Use it for the betterment of self and the, for the uplifting of all of humanity. Yes, sir. That's a fact. Not, man, what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> not that work. No. Oh. Maurice King is long. Chase Islam, I see you in the in the, in the in the chat going crazy, brother. Appreciate your support. Yes, yeah, see you. I That's see my brother you. there, man. I know. I see him crazy. in the chat, man. The brothers definitely in support mode, one hundred percent. Appreciate y'all. Yes, okay. sir. Make sure y'all hit the like button. Don't forget to hit the like button. You know, um, we have the uh, the cash app pinned in the chat. How a matter of fact, what I'll do here is put it on the screen. If you desire to, to donate, the cash app is on the screen. Uh, we, ask, we we don't ask for anything in particular. Whatever you can donate is appreciated. So we continue to do the work that we do to get this information onto the into the algorithm and cast this signal into the bra into the matrix. Um but anyway, go ahead, brother. It's only a tear bit left, but we're just going to reconcile everything with uh, all those three spots because everybody's still comfortable with Mecca, you know, of course. And the one we're catching that connection from Mecca to Petra and how everything that we say was happening in Mecca back then was actually occurring in Petra back then. And they were there plenty of references even in the Hadith and Bible that talk about those things and hint at it being in a completely different spot than the, the place that we know of as, as Mecca today. <clears throat> this is this is so because the the Encyclopedia of Islam kind of uh, shows that there are two distinct groups of Nabataeans documented through the Arab literature. So we bump into two first. We bump into the Nabata Shams or the Nabataean from Shams or the, the Syria, uh, Jordan, Jerusalem area. And we have Nabata Iraq. Or apparently there were some Nabataean type people uh, who lived in the Iraq and Iran area. And this is exactly why there's a, a Kaaba of, of Zoroaster in a, in a completely different country. They also had a similar uh, technology of channeling in water. They also mastered water irrigation. They were also carving things into living rock. I mean, the architecture was the same, but their belief systems and their cultures were different. So not using the belief system and the cultural differences is anything to drive a stake in between the two. Their, their, their inner traditions is, is, is exactly the same. Their, their sciences were exactly the same. How they lived, it was exactly the same where they lived was exactly the same. The things they had to overcome as a community were exactly the same. 
So when you have that many similarities going on with people that are also studying the same sun and moon and stars and going through similar things down here, it's as above, so below, man. So of course they, they will have, you know, certain similar traditions. So it's not a bad thing that there used to be a Kaaba and Petra and there still is one in Iran, but so with the one in Mecca right now, it's historically, if we were to look into um, a Parthenian or a Blithenian uh, general, uh, Al Hajjaj, Ibn Yusuf. Mm -hmm. he's, he's even mentioned in a few Hadith, but Al Hajjaj, Ibn Yusuf was a. It's, it's hard to even call Al Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf a Muslim, right? Because what he showed up with was something that was kind of Islam. But he had a, a he had an utter disdain for everything Islamic. Al Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf was the one that was slinging those flaming uh, catapult stones over into the sacred city of Petra that we hinted at earlier. Al Hajjaj mm. Ibn Yusuf was the one that was the one that came back with uh, backup after he couldn't fully penetrate the city. And when he came this time, they demolished everything. And in order to save the black stone, the people there put it in the, uh, the black sheep, the sheet of silk, that same story we can get in the Hadith about Prophet Muhammad taking the, the black stone and then putting it into the Kaaba. That same exact story shows up with those Nabataeans after Al Hajjaj comes in to, to conquer them. Al Hajjaj was a Nabat al Iraq. Al Hajjaj comes from descendants of the Achaemenid Empire. Al Hajjaj was, was from people who, who were kind of persecuted by these Umiyads and these. Uh, and, and the Abbasids, two different ruling uh, Muslim factions. Mm. Today, we can kind of look at the Umiyyads and the Abbasids as, as our, our current Sunni and Shia split, pretty much. Okay. I hate to, uh, I don't want to take anything away from them. I'm not doing that, but just to generalize for the sake of time, it's, it's the, the easiest way to look at it because it's, uh, you still have their linguistic things that you can trace back and forth. You still have cultural things between those two that you can trace back and forth to, to kind of verify, hey, wait a minute, these are the same people. They've been fighting each other for the last 1400 years, trying to be the one that's in control of, of, of what? Who, who is it? Who, who owns Islam? Allah. Exactly. Why in the world are men trying to fight over who's going to be the next caliph or who's going to conquer and rule this place? Like, how about trying to work together? Exactly. Like, the Nabat al Iraq or the Nabataeans that had a similar lifestyle in Iraq and Iran but essentially wound up coming into uh, Syria, the Jordan, Jerusalem area, and they bumped into the Nabat al Sham or the Nabataeans there that were living a, a similar way, hence the, the way that they were described. But the Nabataeans that were there were the ones that were the predecessors to this Islam that we call today, not the ones that wound up coming in because they had such a disdain for it. They would just demolish it. Mm. There's Hadith about Al Hajjaj coming into that city after demolishing it when people were still trying to hold on to the last little bit of stuff they had there. And they were going around the Kaaba to, to do their, their circumambulation or what was left of the Kaaba at that time. And Al Hajjaj shows up on his horse and his, and his armor and walks around the Kaaba on his horse and then takes his horse up on Arafat and sits there and looks at all the villagers taking everything from the city. You ain't supposed to be on no horse going on, on the, the Hajj or doing any of those things. Because he wasn't no, he wasn't no Muslim. He did that as a sign of, of, of like, hey man, y'all are defeated. Like, your 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 kaaba ain't even standing no more. All of mm -hmm. these catapult stones around here are, are what knocked your kaaba down. This is what knocked the Qasr al bent down. The the photo in that top uh, left hand corner. Now what are y'all gonna do? Like, y'all don't want to leave? Okay. Al Hajjaj got one final thing, and and this is it. I don't even really know whether to equate it to the earthquake that's in the Quran about that city because they, they'll overlay that as a, a Thamud. You know, Thamud said to have been destroyed by an earthquake in the Quran. 
Petra actually did get hit by an earthquake in like the third or fourth century. Mm. And in that earthquake, it damaged the last of their working uh, water pipes and water resources. The last yeah. of the working water resources were damaged in that one earthquake. But every time I looked up like damaged water, trying to figure it out and piece it all together, the only other time that uh, water being uh, water sources being damaged or water being cut off and taken away is when Al Fajaj Ibn Yusuf was in Petra in southern Jordan. Probably one of the most brutal uh, <laughs> Caleb generals that, that came in at that point in time conquering people because to say that he, he was so ruthless that he, if a person made the most minor uh, mistake or offense or would even look at him wrong and not correct himself when he looks back at him he would he would figure out a way to then use their i guess their text use quran hadith and whatnot to, to find a way to kill the person and then would shoot chop nigga head off and then keep on going around conquering this group just trying to find ways to, to to brutalize and kill people so he would be seen as this you know this big bad guy conqueror and ruler which he he, he, he did some damage, but it was it's, it's him. Al Hajar Ibn Yusuf was the reason that that black star had to be blue. Mm. It was all it was all. I won't say it was all him because Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan was the, the, the caliph at that time. Al, um, Al Hajar was a general for him. He was also appointed to governor. Of a couple of different cities when Abdul Malik saw how efficient, we'll say, we'll say uh, Al Hajjaj was at disposing of enemies of the caliphate or uh, conquering and taking uh, land and bringing back booty and slaves. Right. At that same point in time in history, we, will, we start bumping to like some of the most brutal doggone slavery them Arabs were doing at that point in time. This is moving really? up to the Arab slave trade. Oh. Because of someone like him that has such a disdain for an original way of life that if he would have just looked at the inner traditions of what he had from where his ancestors came from to what those people had there, it's the same thing. Exactly. It's, it's, it's the exact same thing. Islam is older than the sun, moon, and stars. People will generalize and say the Zoroastrians were fire worshippers, but of course we know it's deeper than that because the sun's not on fire. <laughs> Right, exactly. Right. So it's it's, it's 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 all it's always deeper than that, and I feel yeah. like if 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 one back then we just if, I know I'm not wishing for an ideal utopia, right? But like, let me show up and stand on your own principles, man. Stand on your ethics and morals, and you see some other brothers that are living a life similar to yours. Old people of the book, right? Like the Quran says, doesn't matter whether you're Christians, Muslims, or Sabians. As long as you believe in Allah and believe in his angels and his messengers in the last day, then you shall neither grieve like you just come on. The books even say, like, man, if you can if you see that those people believe in God, leave them alone. If you can see that those people pray on the regular, leave them alone. If you can see that those people have a service that they go to, then leave them alone. We see that those people do good works, good deeds, and charity. And leave them alone. Because all those things that we're being told to leave them alone about are also things that we do. We pray, we go to uh, service on Friday, we do good deeds and, uh, and charity and, and donations and things like that. Well, we would have stripped our titles off of ourselves, or we would have stripped off how we personify ourselves as whatever we are and just go outside and start doing those things. Then, like, you really wouldn't be able to tell who is who. Unless you just hear a Christian say, oh, praise Lord Jesus, or you hear a Muslim say, oh, somebody like, that'll be the only thing that could let you know that all of these people who have just stripped titles are this type of believer or that type of believer. Mm -hmm. But I get it. That was the center of the trade route, Shake. You mm -hmm. know how much taxes and money they made by, by, by just by, by holding out that one place? And then if anybody got on their bad side, they would raise the prices just for them. Like you right. bring your stuff in, we're gonna, we're gonna raise the taxes on your imports. Now you gotta pay us to even bring it in here to turn around and sell it in the first place. They were geniuses, man. Geniuses. 
other than the fact that when Al Hajjaj showed up, like he was just a little bit too brutal with, you know, the, the, the conquering tactics. He was so brutal that people would run back to Abdel Malik and, and be like, look, man, hey, KT, can you tell us that Hajjaj is like, calm down. Bro. He keep he, he doing some stuff that like is in the book for us not to do. Mm-hmm. And then Abdel Malik would have to then send a letter to Al Hajjaj and say, man, I heard you've been doing this and this to young people and you've been killing kids and whole families, man. Like, you ain't got to do all that. Like, do what I sent you to, down there to do. Like, don't go over the top. But Al Hajjaj never, never stopped. He just kept on trying to kind of rule and conquer and then stay in control, uh, stay, stay relevant, I guess, because everything he brought was kind of. Like I said, everything he brought wasn't quite Islam. Like, I don't even know if I can personify him as being a Muslim, because even though he built mosques, right, on his uh, on his journey, conquering place to place for control for Abdul Malik, one one peculiar thing about the mosques that are attributed to Al Hajjaj is that even them, they don't point to Mecca, and they don't point to Petra. Dan Gibson um, in his book, Let the Stone Speaks, and in uh, there's a series online called The Sacred City, talks about these uh, between mosques. All right, there's about 60 or 65 mosques that uh, Dan Gibson went to to still plot these uh, Kibla directions right. And then he found out that these 60 to 65 mosques pointed somewhere between Mecca and Petra and didn't point at either one of them. Because Al Hajjaj wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't Sunni or Shia, he wasn't a Basi. Yeah, he was trying to conquer all both of them. All right. He might have had ties to, you know, one or the other because he knew he could use them for control based on what his general told him to do, but mm-hmm. he didn't care. He probably just wait for one of them to jump wrong and kill them too. Like he would do all the slaves. Yeah. Right. Right, man. But um, it's some interesting history, though, because I mean, some of it might seem a little, you know, like it might shake a person, but if we, if we go through it, and especially us, like uh, on the path that we're on with the spiritual traditions, we always keep these things here working in proper uh, working order. So Why don't TV? Peace, God. Hey, peace of the country. All right, keep your bass. Peace, God. Why is the dog TV? Yes, sir. Over there, some good word too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He, he most definitely does. Everybody in the chat, if you're not subscribe, subscribe to Wild the Dome TV. Go over there and check the brother out. Check his content out. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button. Help the brother get into the algorithm even further than he already is, brother. We could all use the help. Let's assist one another. Make sure you hit the like button, family. I mean. I felt that was kind of hard, bro. Like we went over those those the the, the mosques. There's some that do face Petra. There was obviously something going on in Petra. There was a Kaaba there in Petra. Remember at the beginning we mentioned the Hatem or that curved wall in uh, mm-hmm. on the Kaaba's northwest side is within two degrees of error uh, to be pointed directly at the spot where the Kaaba was in Petra. The northwest. All right, northwest. Huh. <laughs> oh yeah, Chase. Yeah. Northwest. <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs> yeah. When we come over to like the spots where some of us got uh, a little bit more connection and ancestry, right? If we come back into Egypt or Kemet, Sudan, we come back into uh North Africa and countries up there that we know there were more at uh, Muslim societies. There's mosques uh, that Dan Gibson plotted up there, about 30 or 40, that are what he calls parallel. Their, their Kibla isn't, it's also not pointing directly at the Kaaba in Mecca, and it's not pointing directly at the Kaaba in Petra. They're aligned so that they're lined up with the direction that they're facing each other. So if, if the Kaaba in Petra has that curved wall, it's pointing up to Petra, some of these mosques in North Africa follow that exact same line. So they just orient the mosque to match that line. They're not really pointing directly at it, but they're they're parallel to it. 
So their intention is still on this connection between this spot and this spot to where we get this line from. Yeah. Mm. I thought that was pretty unique because uh, Dan Gibson only really saw those types of mosques more so in uh, Spain, uh, North Africa, and some that kind of get close around the, the, the bottom curve of West Africa. Mm. Not too many of those uh, parallel mosques existed on the far, far side of, uh, you know, the so-called Arabian continent. Yes, sir. Yes, so sir. even we then, like, this is our country over there, our continent, uh, Africa, and we have the understanding of there being some connection between this place they want us to pray to in Mecca. And we also see there's a connection to a place that it's pointing to in Petra. So we just decide to take, I hate to say like neutral ground, right? But this is where that, that, that concept of a parallel Kibbutz comes up at. So out of all those mosques that Dan Gibson goes through in his book, uh, Let the Stone Speak, or there's a book he wrote solely on the Nabataeans and the mosques in their area. From what you see is most of them don't get the, the Hydra calendar. So from about 610 current era up into about seven, we say 718, the majority of all the Qiblas or the directions of prayer at the some of the pre-Islamic mosques were facing Petra, right? But somewhere around there, there was that split at 718, same time frame where we get these two people the Marwanids, Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan, and Al Hajjaj coming in. And right around those time frames are when we start to see the Mecca Kibla show up. So now we start to see mosques pointing towards Mecca. Why we don't start to see mosques pointing towards Mecca into the eighth century? Mmm. 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 Now we'll admit, so yeah, now that one kind of hurt, but like then, you know, still gotta study, man. Prophet Muhammad said, seek knowledge from here until China. He didn't tell me to stay in Macon, Georgia. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta go get it. Yes, so, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's why I thought it was cool to find out that there are also people who understood this and they could see the beef between these uh, Umayyads and Abbasids and what used to be like Persians and Zoroastrians to come up with the idea or concept to have the Qibla for certain mosques go directly between this and this, right smack in the middle, or to just be like, you know what, no, we don't want to be like them. We, we're still observing this way of life. We're still observing these practices and cultural traditions, but some of the mosques that were plotted in North Africa and in Spain have the parallel Qibla, meaning they're running directly parallel to both Petra and Mecca. Why all that beef show up between the 600s and the 700s? I thought that's when all the stuff was going on in the Holy Quran, right? Mm. Mm. But it, it seems like immediately after Prophet Muhammad passes away, some Sufi ain't gonna say Prophet Muhammad passed away as soon as he dropped the body. Right? Mm. As soon as he dropped the body, niggas was beefing. Immediately. Immediately, like immediately. Look at what the white companions. Look at what happened within the more science temple of America. Immediately. Right. Well, don't even waste no time. Let's see, that's what we mentioned in the last video, man. Uh but the schisms are the devil. But yes, as sir. soon as he dropped the body with Babu Bakr, uh Uthman, uh Ali, they, they, I, I, all, all three of them, and plus uh, there's another name I can't quite call right now, it's called Furlough, but all four of them are vying to be the next caliph after Prophet Muhammad. All of them, immediately, at the exact same time. Hmm. Beeping within the Ummah, right? beeping within the family, beeping within the community. I understand the succession ship, but in my humble opinion, the only thing that's going to succeed a prophet is the prophet. Exactly. That's it. Because otherwise, none of us can can do <laughs> some of the things that's described that he did. All right, we're in a completely different time. So like right now and then today, it's impossible for us to do some of the things exactly of the way it said he, that he did it in some of those texts. 
So to a certain degree, yeah, shaky, right? Like, yeah, we can't even get anywhere close to being as good at whatever as the Prophet Muhammad. Because it's a whole other time and a whole other degree in, in Arabic, <laughs> you know? That close to the kid can't even speak Arabic. But what we can do is try our best to follow as close to him as we can. Right, exactly. Right, as this close to him as we can. Like, we know we can't get right there at it. You know? We know mm -hmm. we can't get close up until we then drop our body and we're able to vibrate higher. Because is things on the material plane able to vibrate exactly as things on the spirit plane, Robert? I don't think so, right? Mm -hmm. no. but, 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 you know, as our holy prophet noble do Ali teaches us, and there's a uh, an essence within man, you know what I'm saying? The essence of the resurrection. So, you know, it is the possibility of man is to raise this tone, then raise the tone of this, you know, this earthly, this carnal flesh until flesh divine. So, yeah, I do believe that one could vibrate that high, but on a normal, at a normal right no sir nothing mm -hmm. on, the, on the on the on the material plane of vibration is high as our spirit plane most definitely i mean i am gonna take a quick sip to uh scroll through the chat to see if there were any questions or anything that might need to get thrown back or answer i didn't see yes sir yes sir take a look Oh, I'm that's all good. I think we all good on questions. Bark and shake you before. Bark and shake you before. Bark and shake you before. Fire, y'all, fire. Get it in. I said, Bark and Serene, follow. Or K Serene, follow. Bark and Serene, follow. That name, Shake K, me. It all makes sense. Shake uh, Serene Falu also had an, an affinity for studying other people's cultural and religious traditions. So even a Sheikh in our order, that's that's left uh, some teachings after he dropped the body. When he was a Sheikh in the Morid order, after his father, Sheikh Afnu Bamba, Serene Falu and Serene Sally, who both had a love and an affinity for studying chronological history. They wanted to know what happened in other places. Yeah. Not just to be like, man, that religious stuff ain't true. Like, no, they, you can still get the history from the religious perspective because the Quran and the Bible are both history books too if they're read with the right eye. Exactly. Those sheikhs also like to, to study other people's uh, way of life and cultures and religions. So just in case if I bump into somebody that's a, a Sikh tomorrow, then I, I know to walk up to him and hold a finger up and say, it can't cop. Funny thing is, a Sikh actually owns the clothing store beside my family's barbershop. Bro. So the first time I, I saw him, you know, with the, the orange, you know, hey, he come in with everything on. And I'm like, you know what? I think I'm a, hey, what's going on, brother? Man, I know everything's all good, man. I said, everything's going on, man. I don't know. I can't complain, man. It can't cop. And he just, how do you know? Worry about all that. Ik onkar just means uh one god. Ik one onkar god in the Sikh tradition. So esoterically, bro, ain't that what la ila la, la, la means? Are we gonna use a Muslim chant? There's only one. You can call him whatever name you want to, from a Meccan tradition or a Medina tradition or in Nabati in Aramaic or in Farsi from Persia or Iran or the comedic mystery system if we okay. really engulf ourselves in the in the systems and the traditions it won't matter what you study why you on the path because as soon as we get done with this hey i got some mantras to do on my on my yoga pillow and the fact that to a certain degree some people might think i just bust this long wide open no i didn't i can't i'm not big enough I can't. So regardless of what I, I studied or, 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 or researched or ran across or what rabbit hole I dumped into, I know when I come back to the world, I'm going to have to keep this thing here, right? So what better thing to do than focus on higher realities 
and repeat some mantras in another language that have a deeper meaning than anything that I can say in English to make sure I'm still making sure this thing. Head and heart, head and heart cohesiveness. Perfect alignment. Is that? And that's how we reconcile it. So, yeah, we just talked about three different cubes and three different commas and three different peoples throughout chronological history. But at the end of the day, nah, none of them matter. If we ain't focusing on this one, none of them matter. You can point your cobble, you can point your prayer rug at the, at the eastern corner of your house all you want to and make your extra, extra prayers on top of all your extra prayers. But if you go to the grocery store and you see somebody walking behind you in the reflection, of the door you finna get ready to walk into and you just open the door and walk in and you don't hold the door for the person you know is behind you because you saw them in the reflection. What are you doing all that extra stuff for? You saw the person behind you. That was a chance to do a good deed. But you didn't hold the door for the old lady behind you. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Always exactly. had a self-conscious. But see, that's enough that, like we always say, we're finding that way into the heart. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Finding that way into the heart. And the highest form of worship is self and service to humanity. Hold on, let me give a plug right quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted to. Let ones know that, um, here at Let's Think Podcast, we do have by far zipper beads for sale if anyone is interested. I just wanted to show a couple sets off so the people can see. Um, these are the large beads. Beautiful. Straight from Senegal. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We got that. That's how that's the large set. We have the small set. All of these are 100 count. Straight from Senegal. Made by the mortar hits. Yeah, and they ain't gonna find that wood nowhere else. No, sir. No else. I have a couple of these left right here. Got a couple of these left. I think you see the shake with a pair around his neck. I just had a pair of myself. A couple of these left. So, you know, if y'all are interested, you know, hit my IG, Sheik7. You can hit my my um Facebook page, my messenger, Sheik7 Islam L on Facebook. And uh, you know, we, we can get you taken care of if you if if you desire. A pair, a pair, um, by Paul Zippy. Uh, but, um, tonight's shot. Hey, I hope, well, I hope y'all was, y'all, 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 y'all got this, this history lesson. Cause I definitely did. Um, next show, we're going to have. Brother Aboriginal Power coming on. <laughs> Brother be turned up too, bro. It's gonna be one. I'm gonna have to prepare myself for this one. Um we have Sharif on the Bay coming back. I'm not even gonna speak about the topic of that show. We're just gonna bring it. Um we got some things in the work. We got the brother uh Shake is coming back. He's always gonna be one of our uh Premier guest, always coming back to, you know, bless us with his his, his wisdom, to share from what, that which Allah has bestowed upon him as graciously as he does. And we want to extend our honors and gratitude to you, Brother Sheikh Bilal. Honors and gratitude. Who, Sheikh? You know, we Ooh. appreciate Who knows? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um... Everybody in the chat, I appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all chiming in. I appreciate y'all chiming in. I appreciate all the support. Please do not forget to hit the like button. 
Also, if you desire to support the channel, the Cash App is right here on the screen. Please support the channel so we can continue to do what we do and do it at our best. We are planning to upgrade, planning to get, you know, upgrade on some cameras uh, and invest in, into the podcast. So if you like the information, support the channel. Support the channel. And I appreciate everybody who has supported the channel. I, I truly thank you. Um, before I get off of here, I want to extend uh, honors to my leadership at the More Science Temple of America, Sheik Lorenzo Portisell, and our Grand Sheikas, Sister Sheik M. Portisell, and um, all of the staff at the More Science Temple of America. I'd like to stand honors again to my, uh, my brother and my guests, all the brothers and sisters in the, in the order of Sheikh Amakha Dubamba, the Moradiyah order, and uh, we extend our peace, love, and goodwill to all of humanity. Anything you want to say before you sign out, Brother Sheikh? Yeah, just one, uh, one, one final uh, reference and uh, this is a scholarly one uh, on the Encyclopedia of Islam, Volume 7. That's where you can find uh, a ton of information up under the keyword Nabat. All right. Remember, the first son of Ishmael was uh, Nabat, who was uh, the father of the Nabataeans. And uh, there, there's a lot more knowledge, wisdom, and understanding about these groups of people and their origins. And, and how some of their rites and rituals tie into some of the very things we're doing today. Um, thankful for the brother to have this platform, man, and uh, thankful for the light in his heart that always shines out to help show the light to uh, some good people in the world that, that might be in a little bit of darkness, man. We need more and more brothers like that in the world. So I'm, I'm thankful to uh, be a guest on the platform and look forward to returning again. Yes, sir. Now we look forward to. To having you most definitely um as often as you would like to come on the platform and share brother man uh you're most definitely a shake and you're most definitely a teacher so whenever you a lot of places it on your heart so you want to present something to the people you know the platform is always welcome and it's open to you to do just that brother man i mean about seven years of shake Sufi and shake out the bomba teachers floating around back there so yeah we can get it in bro let's continue to keep getting it in it's loud it's loud it's loud well we're gonna sign out we've been online for a minute um great presentation again i thank my brother honest and gratitudes to you it's let's think podcast and we're gonna keep bringing you them topics that they don't want to touch we're gonna touch them it's long it's long.